Hello there. My name is Julie Huang, and I am a scientist in the San Francisco Bay Area and a volunteer of the Young Women in Bio program. Life as we knew it has changed drastically in the last couple of months as we grapple with the new disease, COVID-19. This disease has reached virtually every part of the world, making it a full-fledged pandemic. As the disease has spread, scientists, healthcare providers, and public health experts from around the world have been working urgently on understanding the virus that causes COVID-19 and the symptoms of the disease. Today, I'd like to share with you what we know so far. So let's get started. So what exactly is COVID-19? It is a disease caused by a coronavirus that began infecting people for the first time in December of 2019, hence the name COVID-19. It is a respiratory disease that spreads person to person caused by a novel virus called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2 for short. Humans are no strangers to coronaviruses. Several members of this virus family cause the common cold, but a couple of others, including a strain called SARS-CoV, which was the first SARS coronavirus that emerged in 2003, as well as this current coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, can cause more severe disease in our respiratory system. This coronavirus uses RNA as its genetic material to replicate. The RNA is protected inside a capsid that has a crown of spikes, which not only gives it its name coronavirus, but also enables it to invade human cells. Shown here is a high resolution image of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. You can see that it has this spiky crown exterior that protects the RNA inside this capsid. Now, how exactly does this virus infect and spread? One important feature to keep in mind is that unlike other microorganisms like bacteria, viruses need to infect and get into cells in order to survive. They cannot replicate outside of the cell. This diagram shows the stages of infection and replication that allows a virus to survive and spread. Infection starts with the attachment of the virus to the human cell. The spike proteins that make up the crown binds to a receptor on the human cell, almost like a lock and key. This crucial binding step causes the cell to engulf the virus, bringing it inside the cell. Once inside, the virus can release its content and hijack the cell's machinery to make more of its genetic material RNA, which is then used to make the proteins that make up the rest of the virus. These new viral proteins and RNA assemble into new viral particles called virions, which are then released to infect new cells. As the virus replicates and gets released from the cells, they end up killing the human cell that it first invaded. Now with viruses like the one that causes the common cold or flu, prior exposure has allowed our human um, immune system to develop a strong defense against them when we encounter them again. But COVID-19 is caused by a novel coronavirus. What does that mean? A novel virus is one that the human body has never encountered before and has not previously been identified. This lack of prior exposure makes the human body especially susceptible to infection because our immune system isn't prepared to fight it as quickly as it would with other infectious diseases we've experienced. So where did this virus come from and how did it get to humans? By analyzing the RNA genetic blueprint of the virus, scientists have deduced that this virus originated in bats, which are animals known to naturally carry many coronaviruses. The virus then likely jumped to a second animal carrier and scaly anteater called a pangolin before mutating into a form that can uh, ultimately infect humans. The other two closely related coronaviruses, SARS-CoV, which I mentioned earlier, and MERS-CoV, which had both caused their own outbreaks but is no longer spreading, also originated in bats and had a second animal carrier, the civet cat and the camel, before jumping to humans. So let's pause and review. What is COVID-19? The answer is, COVID-19 is a contagious disease caused by the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, an RNA virus that invades and replicates inside human cells of the respiratory system. So how does COVID-19 actually transmit to be contagious? The COVID-19 virus is contained in respiratory droplets, which can be released when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks, just like when you have the common cold or flu. 
The distance that these droplets can travel from the infected person is about six feet, which is why social distancing is defined by being physically away from someone with a minimum of six feet. These droplets land on surfaces where the virus can survive for a few hours to a few days, depending on the surface material. If an infected person touches their nose or mouth and doesn't wash their hands before touching, say, a door handle, an uninfected person can now catch the virus by touching that same door handle and unknowingly touch their own nose and mouth, thereby infecting themselves. This is why it's so important to wash our hands properly to limit the transmission of this virus. Because fortunately, this virus can be easily inactivated with just soap and water. You can learn more about ways to protect yourself in the module on safe hygiene practices in the era of COVID-19. COVID-19 is highly contagious. In fact, more contagious than the flu, with an r naught value of 2.8. R0 is a measurement of how many people an infected individual will transmit the disease to. So for COVID-19, one infected person can pass the disease to almost three people. You can learn more about R0 and other statistics used to understand COVID-19 in the epidemiology module. As I mentioned earlier, COVID-19 is a disease of the respiratory tract. But what makes it unique and contributes to the deadliness of the disease is the fact that the COVID-19 virus can infect both the upper respiratory tract, which includes your nose, sinuses, and throat, as well as the lower respiratory tract, which includes your windpipe and lungs. So how does the disease progress when someone gets infected? There are four main stages of the disease. The first stage is a person who is infected but not contagious and not symptomatic. The next stage can be one of two outcomes. The infected person can either become contagious but never develop symptoms over the course of the infection. These are known as asymptomatic carriers of the virus. The second outcome is that the infected person can become contagious but is pre-symptomatic, meaning this person isn't showing symptoms yet, but they eventually will. Both of these stages are particularly dangerous because these people do not know that they are infected since they have no symptoms but they're actually spreading the virus as presymptomatic or asymptomatic carriers. These asymptomatic carriers will eventually recover from the infection, but less is currently known how the disease progresses in this group. Eventually, the presymptomatic person will reach the third stage where they become symptomatic. At this point, the person should stay home to recover. Hopefully, the infected person reaches the fourth stage of recovery where they no longer have symptoms and are no longer contagious. But of course, as we're all learning from current accounts, a significant number of people develop severe symptoms that may lead to hospitalization and even death. Recent analysis suggests that up to 25 to 30 percent of infected people may actually be asymptomatic carriers that can spread the virus without ever developing symptoms. These are distinct from those who are presymptomatic carriers, and this distinction is important in accurately tracking how widespread the virus is, which informs how many people will become infected, develop symptoms, and may need hospitalization. This is the recent realization that there may be a significant number of asymptomatic COVID-19 carriers has now led to new recommendations for people to wear masks when out in public to help minimize the chances that an asymptomatic carrier unknowingly spreads the virus to others. So what are the actual symptoms of COVID-19? So first off, symptoms usually develop between two to 14 days after exposure. This is why someone should stay home and self-isolate as soon as they find out that they have been in close physical contact with someone who has COVID-19 even if they don't exhibit symptoms yet. This ensures that in case the person is positive for COVID-19, they do not spread the virus to others unknowingly. The severity of symptoms depends on where the virus infects in the respiratory tract. If the virus stays in the upper respiratory tract, the infected person will experience mild or moderate symptoms such as fever, dry cough, sore throats, etc. Symptoms that are similar to the common cold, which is another upper respiratory tract disease. This person will likely be able to recover from COVID-19 at home. However, if the virus makes its way to the lower respiratory tract, the infected person can develop severe or critical symptoms such as shortness of breath, pneumonia, and lung damage. As the lungs are damaged, it becomes difficult to get enough oxygen to vital organs in the body. 
People who suffer from such critical symptoms will need to go to the hospital where they can be on a ventilator to help them breathe and get the necessary oxygen to stay alive. These are broadly some of the mild and severe and critical symptoms that patients may experience. Not everyone will come down with all of these symptoms, and this list is not exhaustive. As doctors encounter more people who become sick with COVID-19, we are learning what are some of the important signs that suggest someone may have the disease. Ultimately, a test needs to be done to officially diagnose someone with COVID-19. Please see my other module on testing to learn more about how COVID-19 is diagnosed. The good news is that the majority of symptomatic individuals will have mild symptoms and these people can recover at home. However, about 14% of those who get COVID-19 will need to be hospitalized as they develop severe symptoms, and another 4.7% of infected individuals will need intensive care, such as the use of a ventilator, to help them breathe. Though 4.7% doesn't seem to be a very high percentage of cases that end up in critical condition, the fact that so many people are catching this virus because it's so contagious means that the hospitals will quickly be overwhelmed with the number of patients that need intensive care. This is why we are all now doing our part to slow the spread and flatten the curve by staying home and practicing social distancing. You can learn more about what flattening the curve means in the module on the epidemiology of COVID-19 and what social distancing means in the module about social distancing, self-quarantine, and isolation. As more people come down with the disease and we more carefully document the timelines of their disease progression, we can look at the data in more detail of how COVID-19 progresses in patients with different symptom severity levels. As mentioned earlier, a significant percentage of infected individuals remain asymptomatic throughout the infection. This was a group that was originally thought to be rare early on in the pandemic, but as more individuals have been tested, it has become clear that this group is comprised of a significant number of people. Those with mild or moderate symptoms will be able to recover relatively quickly without needing to be hospitalized, while those with severe or critical symptoms will need to be hospitalized and may need ICU care. Some will unfortunately pass away. So another question for you, do all infected individuals of COVID-19 experience symptoms? The answer is no, not all infected individuals experience symptoms. These are asymptomatic carriers of the virus who help the virus spread more quickly through the community. So who is at risk of severe cases of COVID-19? Generally, the most vulnerable who are likely to have a severe case or pass away from COVID-19 are those who are older, have weaker immune systems, or those who have other underlying diseases. These include people who are over 65 years of age, seniors who are living in nursing home or long-term care facilities, immunocompromised patients of all ages, or patients with chronic health issues such as chronic lung disease, asthma, obesity, or heart disease. While the fatality rate is low for younger people, we have seen in the last few weeks in the U.S. that they are just as likely to be infected with COVID-19. Some may require hospitalization, and some will promote the spread as asymptomatic carriers. In this graph, you can see the percentage of those infected who require hospitalization, ICU admission, or ultimately pass away, broken up by the different age groups in the U.S. from February 12th through March 16. While a higher percentage of people over 65 years of age require hospitalization, you can see that there was also a significant percentage of people from age 20 to 64 that also required hospitalization. However, case fatality represented by the black bars only becomes evident for those who are 55 years of age or older, and the case fatality increases for older age groups, which is what we would expect. One last question for you in this module. Should young people like yourselves worry about getting COVID-19? The answer is yes. In the U.S., there have been a significant number of patients that require hospitalization who are less than 50 years of age, including children and teenagers. So COVID-19 can affect young people like yourselves as well. And with that, I'd like to thank you for tuning into this module on COVID-19. Here are some highlights that I hope you'll take away from this. COVID-19 is a contagious disease caused by the RNA coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. This is a novel coronavirus which makes humans especially susceptible to COVID-19. 
Symptoms typically develop between 2 to 14 days after exposure. However, about 25 to 30 percent of those who do get infected remain asymptomatic. While most people experience mild symptoms, some will experience severe symptoms requiring hospitalization. The most vulnerable people are those who are 60 years or older, those living in nursing homes, those who are immunocompromised, or those who have underlying chronic health issues. Young people are also getting COVID-19, and while less likely to die, they may still require hospitalization. So congratulations. You now know the basic signs of COVID-19 and will be able to follow new developments as they occur. Please continue to check for updates because new information is collected every day, and this can change our current understanding of this coronavirus and COVID-19. I hope this information empowers you to be proactive and take the proper precautions to protect yourself and your loved ones. Be well and stay safe.